welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Dan Roth. If you would stand to your feet, I'm going to get down on my knees and let's go before the Lord tonight in prayer. Father, tonight we come to you in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, we're grateful that we get to be in your presence tonight. God, I thank you for the things that have already taken place in this church services. You've come and inhabited the praises of your people. Lord, where your presence is, there your power is also. So God, we just thank you for the gifts that you've given already, for the things that you've done, for the blessings, for the provisions, for the touch of God, for the healings, God. We just receive it and give you thanks in Jesus' name. And Lord, tonight, we don't want to stop there, God. We want to go further with you. We want to hear the word of the Lord. So tonight, as we open up the word, God, we pray that you open it up and that you would open us up to receive it, God. Lord, we pray that you give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. May we be the good ground where the word is sown. And Lord, may it produce something in each and every one of our individual lives. And God, we just ask this blessing upon ourselves, but also we would ask it for all the churches that are preaching and hearing the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, both here in the Inland Empire as well as around the planet. There are brothers and sisters, Lord, and no time do we think of ourselves as any better than anyone else. But we see ourselves as co-laborers and workers together in your field, building your kingdom. God, we give you the praise and the glory and the honor. In Jesus' mighty name, we're all in agreement. We say, amen. amen. You can have a seat. Get your Bibles out and go with me to the book of Luke. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 2. Like I mentioned, we're going to take a fresh look at Luke chapter 2, speaking of the birth of Jesus. And, and I, I'm just going to read one verse tonight. Luke chapter 2, verse number 7. Gospel of Luke chapter 2. Verse number seven, for those of you that don't have your Bibles, don't worry, we'll put it up on the overheads for you so you can follow along. But next time you come, bring your Bible so that you can get it in your heart, get it in your own Bible, you can mark it down, you can write some notes, that sort of a thing, and get back to it and start learning where things are in your Bible, and it will be an encouragement to you. Luke chapter two, verse number seven says this word, speaking of Mary, and just to set the scene for you, there's been a census that's taking place in, in Rome, and so all of the Roman provinces, all of the Roman Empire is, is taking a census at this time, and it's during this time that Joseph and Mary are traveling, and they go to the city of David, then they go to Bethlehem, and there in Bethlehem, they, the time for Jesus to be delivered is finally full. It's finally time for her to have this baby. There they are. They're trying to find a place, and we read in verse number 7, Luke chapter 2, it says, and she brought forth her firstborn son. And wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, I don't know. Sometimes we take a look at a verse like that and we read right through it. We know that. We've got that. We've heard that from the time that we were young. Maybe you saw the flannel board stories there in Sunday school or Sabbath school class. And you remember that there was like this, this motel type thing, you know, and here's the innkeeper with an angry look on his face pointing to the, to the stable. And there, a, a, a downcast Mary and Joseph are going to the, to the manger, and, and there's baby Jesus inside of the little, you know, manger. But when we get a picture of what's really going on here, it says that she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now, there was crazy things going on at the time. You remember there was a census going on. So everybody had to go somewhere. So in the natural, there were a lot of things taking place. There was probably a hustle and bustle about them, probably a lot of people everywhere. There was, there was probably uh, no room, not just at the inn, but also in the homes and in, in the different places. People had people from out of town and people coming in and people uh, were, were out of town themselves. And so things weren't normal at this time. There was a lot of activity going on. And so the innkeeper, most likely, before we cast stones at him, the innkeeper most likely was doing his job. Here's a young man, here's a young woman, and he doesn't know them from anybody else, and he's got his in, and so therefore, what is he doing? He's saying, listen, I don't have any room, and maybe he could have had a room, but it was reserved for somebody else, but I, he doesn't know them from Adam, and so he says, you know what, I, I, I don't have any place for you here. And there in the hustle and bustle, this young couple got lost, and, and they had to go their way, they had to find a place. And so what does she do? She brings forth her firstborn son, wraps him in swaddling cloths, lays him in a manger. There they are in a stable. There they are in a place where animals were kept. The first breaths that Jesus takes are filled with the smells of hay and of animal urine and dung. But it says because there was no room for them in the inn. 
today, we can learn from this. We can find something out. Because sometimes in this season, we can lose Jesus in the hustle and bustle and the activity of life or, or even in just our occupation. Listen, this is what I've got to do. This is my duty. This is where I'm at. This is what I do. And, and we don't make room for Jesus in our lives at Christmas. In fact, the title of tonight's message is How to Ruin Christmas. Kind of a funny title, but, but I believe that I've got your attention. And we're going to take a look at some things, you know, kind of a funny title. We'll, we'll take a look at some things that, that we would all say, oh, that's, that's uh, you know, kind of silly. That might be kind of funny. And, and maybe as you look at it, you'll say, well, that's obvious, Pastor. I understand that. I get that. But as we go, I believe that learning from this, sometimes learning from the negative and learning from the opposite, we can contrast that and learn not just how to ruin Christmas, but how to have the best Christmas you've ever had in your entire life. How to have a Christmas that's so memorable that your family will talk about it for years to come. How to have a Christmas that's so great that not only is, is your life impacted, but the life of those around you is impacted. God can do great and mighty and wonderful things during this season. It's an opportune time, church. And let's not get so caught up, get so busy, get so distracted in the hustle and bustle of life and of the times that we miss out on Jesus. So how to ruin Christmas. A couple of things that I want to take a look at tonight. Three things that we'll take a look at. On how to ruin Christmas, and as we learn these things, like I said, we're going to learn really how to have a great Christmas in the process. Are you ready? Okay, how to ruin Christmas for the three of you that responded. Number one is make Christmas about anything other than Christ. That's the biggest way to ruin Christmas. Just make it about anything other than Christ. Now, I honor the memory of people like St. Nicholas, who was a, a real saint and actually was a very godly man and, and did great things on the earth. But when we focus on a man, rather than focusing on the God man, focusing on Jesus, we've gotten our attention in the wrong spot. I, I, I celebrate the snow, and I, and I love this time of year. My goodness, this morning and yesterday morning, when the clouds parted and we could see the peaks around us in this valley, looking up and, and seeing the snow-capped mountains and the signs of the seasons and all that kind of stuff, that's, that's beautiful, that's wonderful. But if I get so caught up in the creation that I fail to give glory to my Creator, I have missed the point. And so during this time of year, yes, there can be fun, yes, there can be lights, yes, there can be decorations, yes, there can be uh, uh, different parties and, and dinners and meetings and cards and friendships and all the things that go with Christmas. But the moment that those things take the place of Christ, we've missed the point. Now all of a sudden we've got Xmas rather than Christmas. And I know some people say, well, that's, that's still Christmas, Pastor. That's just an abbreviated way of saying it. But listen, all we're doing is we're signing on the dotted line. There's a real name that goes in that spot. It's the name above every other name. It's the name that takes the highest place. It's the name that takes the highest priority. And Christmas is about Christ. Christmas is about Christ. You notice in Luke chapter 2, verse 7, we just read it. It says, and she brought forth her firstborn Son, here's Mary. Here she is in the hustle and bustle. Here they were trying to find a place, but there was a priority. There was something happening in her life that took priority over everything else that was happening. They weren't going to go and get in a line to go pay their taxes. They weren't going to go and get in a line to mark down their names on the census. They weren't going to do any of that kind of stuff, even though the king of the known world at that time had moved the entire Roman Empire to do this. That didn't matter at this moment. What mattered was that Jesus Christ was coming. She brought forth her firstborn son. And we need to take note that at Christmas, we need to bring forth the firstborn son. We need to bring Jesus out into the open. We need to bring Jesus into everything that we say and into everything that we do. We need to put a priority in, and, and place that priority on Jesus Christ and the things of God. Jesus is the priority. He is the reason for the season. And we make it about gifts. We make it about anything else. We make it about snow. We make it about decorations. We make it about parties. We make it about any of that kind of stuff. We've missed the point. And we've excluded and X'd out Jesus from Christmas. You're there in Luke. Uh, turn with me to the book of Galatians. They're in the New Testament in Galatians. And Galatians is a book of realignment. The apostle Paul writes to the Galatians because he had found out that they were starting to follow some other doctrine, some other teaching. They were getting off of the main thing, getting off of the spirit of God and getting off of what they had been taught about the gospel of Jesus Christ, getting onto the works of the flesh. 
And so here Paul writes to the Galatians in Galatians chapter number four. Take a look at what he says in Galatians chapter four, verse number 19. Galatians chapter four, verse number 19. He says, my little children for whom I labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Wow. So Mary brought forth her firstborn son. And now here the Apostle Paul is writing to some people who got their attention and their focus off of Jesus Christ. And what does he say? He says, my little children for whom I labor. He's saying the time has come. There's an important thing at hand. Yes, there's a lot of other stuff that's there to distract you, to deter you, to get you off of Jesus. But I'm laboring right now. And the important thing right now is what? Labor in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Until Christ is formed in you. In other words, it didn't matter if other things were formed in them. Good work ethic, good morals. All that stuff would come with Jesus Christ. Didn't matter if, if the, 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 the works of the law were present in them. Why? Because you would fulfill the law if you had Christ in you. Because Christ is the fulfillment of the law. And so here we find at Christmas, Mary brings forth her firstborn son. And now we see these people had gotten off. And Paul writes to him, he says, you need to get refocused. You need to get back to the essentials. You need to get back on Jesus, and I'm laboring what's important right now. The reason why I'm going through this pain and this trial and this anguish with you is because I'm laboring in birth again until Christ is formed in you. Church, the reason why you come to church, the reason why you open your Bible, the reason why you pray, the reason why you sing to God is to get your heart back on the things of God. It's easy to get distracted. But let, let the king of distracted talk to you for a second, okay? Because it's easy for me. I know personally, if I get a phone call or if I get a text or, or, or if there's a television on or if there's anything there to distract, my attention just goes everywhere. You know, I, I, I could go off in things. I could be in prayer, in the middle of prayer. All of a sudden, I'm thinking about what I'm going to do, what I, where I'm going to go, what I'm going to say, different things like that. And, and I get easily distracted, and so it, it, it is a tough thing for some of us to do. But church, that's why we come to church, is to get refocused on the things of God. That's why we open our Bible on a daily basis and try and connect with God and get into the presence of God. And my encouragement to you is to not get so busy in the hustle and bustle, not get so busy trying to check off the list, not get so busy trying to get gifts for everybody in your life or cards for everybody in your life or make sure that you don't offend somebody because you didn't send them the Christmas card or because you couldn't make it to their meeting. No, let's get focused on Jesus. And let's let him work and will in his life, his good pleasure in us. Are you listening tonight? How to ruin Christmas. Number one is make Christmas about anything other than Christ. Number two, how to ruin Christmas. Here's a good one. This is an easy way to ruin Christmas. Number two is to get so focused in the world that you miss Jesus. You say, how is that different than the first one, Pastor? Let's talk about this for a second. It's easy to lose focus, like we talked about, and put focus on life and world issues. Why? Because they're screaming at us. Literally, we have day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, there are things that we have to do in life. Plain and simple. For instance, we have to go to work. You don't work, you don't eat. The Bible says that. And we could get involved in a good thing and miss the God thing. Are you listening? See, sometimes well-meaning people have the best of intentions and we get off into things that the world is doing rather than getting into what God is doing. And so, yes, we may say, oh, yeah, Christmas is about Christ, and then we focus in another area. You see the difference there? That's where number one is, is when you make Christmas about something else. Well, a lot of times it's easy for us to say, oh, yeah, Christmas is about Christ. You know, I, I, I've got my manger scene on my lawn. I, I, I go to church on, on Christmas, that sort of a thing. Very easy to do those things and to, just to, to put that thing in its place and to say that's what it is. And then all of a sudden we start to get focused in other areas. A lot of stuff going on in our world these days. Tragedies happening, things that should not happen. A lot of dis disappointments, a lot of discouragements. We look at the nations, a lot of attention is focused on the Middle East right now. A lot of things going on and taking place there. 
and life issues are coming up. I mean, above and beyond what you could see on the news, you just look in your life, and if your life was a newspaper, the headline would be, you know, the same headlines. We're in recession. There's not enough money. Uh, we don't know how we're going to make it. Uh, people are fighting. Don't know what's going on with my neighbors, you know. I, 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 I having trouble on the job. And, and our headlines would be very similar to the headlines we see in the newspaper. And we can get so focused on those things that sometimes we get off of what God is doing in our life. Remember that with world issues, right? We see world issues and sometimes we get scared. We say, I don't know what's going to go on. I don't know what's going to happen. And that fear tries to grip us. Man, could, could they take away this? Could they do that? Is it going to be like other nations? Are we going to be a, a post-Christian society, you know, like we see in other nations, post-modern, all that kind of stuff, godless, irreligious, all that kind of stuff? Listen, I don't care about any of that stuff. You know why? Because God is on the throne. And the Bible says that the government is on Jesus' shoulders and that all authority that is on the earth has been given by God. And remember that it was God that moved a king of the known world at that time to move the nations, to move a young married couple, a betrothed couple, to get into Bethlehem so that they could deliver the Messiah who is prophesied that he would be born in Bethlehem. See, God knows what he's doing in the ages. God knew what he was doing at Christmas. God still knows what he's doing today. And so when we take a look at the world around us, realize that God is still in control. He didn't lose control when the end of the book was written. No, that, that just gives us a peek into what's in our future. See, God is a God of yesterday. God is a God of today. God is a God of forever. And so our future, when we look into our life issues, we should realize that God is in control of not only the big scale of things, but also the very small and minute things. Think about it for a second. Here Jesus is, born in a manger. Here Jesus is, there were so many prophecies, so many things that had to take place. And God not only took care of the big issues, but he took care of the small issues. God has everything under control. We see Jesus born, laid in a manger. Here he quietly slips into the world. Here he comes, unknown and unnoticed. You and I have to realize that even though the world doesn't notice Jesus, even though life is going to try and get us unfocused from Jesus, that we need to keep our focus. Now, that, does that mean that we don't go to the work Christmas party Look, can, can we get real for a second? You're saying, Pastor, I know that there are things coming up. Should I not go to the work Christmas party because I'm supposed to focus on Jesus and there's going to be some ungodly things taking place? People are going to be drinking. People are going to be gossiping, you know, and, and it just turns into this weirdness, you know, and then everybody's ashamed the next day when they go to work. Should I not go to that? Well, you have to make that decision. I would suggest go ahead and go, but be a witness for Jesus. Don't plunge in with them. Don't drink. Don't gossip. Be there to be a light. Be there to be a designated driver. Be there to shine the light of Jesus and, and, and go out of your way and, and bless somebody and encourage somebody and tell them they're doing a great job. Uh, respect your boss. How about that? And tell them you honor them at this time of year and you're so thankful that God has given you a job. See what happens when you go to work the next day. See what kind of respect and honor comes back to you because of what you've sown into them. You say, well, does that mean that we don't keep our family traditions, Pastor? I mean, we have some family traditions. No, keep your family traditions. I encourage family traditions, but not at the cost of focusing on Jesus. That means you still go to church. That means you still keep your relationship with God at the forefront. And then watch God bless the family traditions. Are you listening tonight? How to ruin Christmas. Number one is make Christmas about anything other than Christ. Number two is get so focused in the world that you miss Jesus. Uh, scripture for that, a couple of quick scriptures. Um, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 4, let's put it up on the overhead. It says, for we spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. Isn't that crazy? We all can identify with that. We have wasted enough time doing what the people without God do. That's what Gentile really means, is a people without a covenant or a people without God. We've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. See, we have been so focused before we met up with Jesus on the things of this world. And it goes on when we walk in lewdness, lust, drunkenness, reveries, drinking parties, and abominable idolatries. And that was just at Christmas. No, I'm just kidding. That, that could be every day. But we focused on those things beforehand. And now our focus is on Jesus Christ. Also in uh, Philippians chapter 2, you're there in Galatians. Turn two books over to Philippians. Let's take a look at this together, Philippians. 
Philippians chapter number 2, verse number 14 and 15. Remember, I talked about being that light, being that witness. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and verse number 15 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing. See, let's stop right there for a second. Sometimes this time of year, it's easy to complain. I'm so busy. Uh, there's not enough. Uh, I, I, I've got too much on my plate. Uh, you know, all those things. People don't care, this and that. And just complain and complain and complain and complain. But God comes along and he says, don't act like that. Don't be like that. Do all things without complaining and what? Disputing. Disputing. You know what? Sometimes at the family get together, you start trying to bring up Jesus Christ and it'll bring up a fight. It's time to love people to life. Pray and ask God to open the door. And to share Jesus with your life, to share Jesus. When they ask you what you did this past weekend, hey, I went to church. Don't preach at me. Okay. You would have liked it. I go to a cool church. The music is rocking. Man, they, they played Silent Night like it was Motown, for goodness sakes. I mean, I know the song was written on a guitar, but not like that. Hello. Hello. But it says, do all things without complaining and disputing. This is not the time for an argument. This is not the time to, to defend the faith. There's some people who say, well, I'm defending the faith. No, you're not. You're pushing people away. Love them in. Bring them in. Look at what it says. Do all things without complaining and disputing. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. Look at this. Look at this. Among whom you shine. It's lights in the world. Think about it this way at Christmas. Christmas in our year is the darkest time of the year. Days are getting shorter. The light of the sun is at its smallest point right now because of the winter solstice. And it's during this time, this darkest time of the year, that people on their houses string lights across their houses, roll out the lights, and, and, and you can drive. I mean, there are, there are spectacles out there in the world that people drive for hours to go and look. You know, there's one of our cities up here in the east has a whole three houses that are all, like you can tune your radio in, and as you tune your radio in, it plays music, and you watch it dance, and you watch it go through a whole routine, all that kind of stuff. I was just uh, over the, the hills here with my parents, and, and we went across the street, and every year across the street from where my parents live, there are two houses and these two houses are so lit up that literally the night sky above it is radiant. And I mean, it's just all sorts of stuff. There were people out there taking pictures, people walking. There was a traffic jam, all this kind of stuff. And, and so we just drove by because we had the kids with us and it was time to get them in bed. But we drove by and all the kids were just wide-eyed. Wow, look at that. How do they do that? You know, my wife and I are talking about the, the bill. You know, we're saying, you know, we're in that place right now where we're not talking about how they do that, how they string up all the We're talking about how do they pay for that. I mean, that, that's like a lot of money right there, you know. And, and I can just see that meter on the back of their house just spinning, you know. Zzz, you know, they've gone past the ultra peak time. And Edison is just saying, yes, keep it going, you know. But did you know that your light can shine brighter than that? Did you know that this time of year, this dark time, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation who doesn't care about Jesus, you shine your light. You, you be joyful. You be happy. Smile, church. It'll do more for you than a million frowning arguments ever will. Love somebody. Bring them in. Bless somebody. Spend and be spent so that you can win some to the Lamb. Win for Him the reward. Of his suffering. How to ruin Christmas. How to ruin Christmas. Make it about anything other than Jesus. Get so focused in the world that you miss Jesus. Number three. Number three. How to ruin Christmas is just to plain shut Jesus out. Just shut Jesus out. Luke chapter 2 verse 7. She brought forth her firstborn son. Wrapped him in swaddling cloths. Laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now many people in the world say the phrase... There's a time and a place for everything. So you bring up Jesus, and they say, listen, this is a family get-together. This is the one time of the year that we all come together, and you're going to preach at us. There's a time and a place for everything. Keep that in church. And we all know we've been there. Maybe we've even said that. 
But the problem is that they don't really mean that there's a time and a place. See, if there was a time and a place, they would say, I want to talk to you about Jesus, and, and, and maybe not right now, but let's get together over coffee, and I really want to hear what you have to say. No, what they're really saying is, I have no time, and I have no place for Jesus. And they shut him out. And while the world is shutting him out, I'm sorry, but I will not be shut up. And this is an opportunity, church, to shout. This is the year of the shout here at The Rock. And, and, and you know, I know that sometimes we're afraid of stepping on people's toes. We're afraid to, you know, be that kooky, crazy Christian that people don't like. We're afraid to speak up for Jesus. But listen, you can love people. You can share, share Jesus with your actions. But there comes a time and a place. There is a time and a place to open your mouth and start to declare, to speak about Jesus, to tell someone about Jesus. It's Christmas. This is the time, this is the hour, today is the day of salvation, now is the time for us to rise up as a church, to understand and to discern the times, and to start to bring people into salvation, to start to introduce them to this Jesus. The world had shut them out. Now, like I started this out, you know, we, we maybe can't get so mad at the innkeeper because there have been times in our life where we've been discouraged where we've gone the wrong way, where we've done the run, wrong thing, and we have shut Jesus out of our own life and said, Jesus, yeah, you're Lord, you're all that, but you can't come in right now. I'm going to do me. And we've kept Jesus out. But that's a good way to ruin Christmas. This is a time where it's time to let him in. As Christians, we should be so wise to see the place of Christ in all areas of our life. There's a place for Jesus in politics because the government is upon his shoulders. There's a place for Jesus in science because he's the creator of all things. There's a place for Jesus in our entertainment because he's given us all things, the Bible says, richly to enjoy. See, God is in everything. And as you see God in everything, as you keep that focus on Jesus and not shut him out, but prepare for him room. Wide, spacious room, living room. Make room for Jesus. Make room for him in your heart. Make room for him in your life. You say, but pastor, I feel guilty because I have shut him out. You know, I, I, I've been really dirty. I'm too dirty. I, I can't let Jesus in. You know, I'll get myself cleaned up. Listen, Jesus was born and laid in a manger. That's a feeding trough for animals. He is used to our dirt. Are you listening tonight? He understands it. He knows it. He's not shy about it. He, he, he sees the innermost parts of every heart. There's nothing that's covered. Everything is laid bare, the Bible says, before his eyes of whom we are to do. The Bible talks about. And so we ought to be wise enough to know that, hey, you know what, Jesus? I've been a rascal. I've been messed up. I've been messing around. But come on in. Clean me up from the inside out. Come and be king in this heart. Sometimes people say, but I'm too poor. He was wrapped in swaddling cloths, not in royal robes. He wasn't given in baths and, you know, of milk and, you know, all this kind of stuff. It wasn't like that, perfumes and people feeding him peeled grapes and that sort of thing when he came. No, he's wrapped in swaddling cloths. There was no, no family except mom and dad and some shepherds that the angels brought in. See, there, there wasn't any of this. Yes, wise men came from the east, but listen, wise men still seek him. And so you and I need to be wise enough to not shut Jesus out, to make room for him. You say, but I'm not like those wise men. I'm uneducated. I'm not cool. I'm not popular. Listen, neither were the shepherds keeping their watch by night. These were guys that were out. They smelled like sheep. It was the middle of the night. They were at their post. but They were just there. And when they heard about Jesus, they believed the report, and they came running to find out and see this great sight, bowed down and worshiped him, a baby. If you open the door of your heart and make room for him, he'll turn your manger into a royal throne and he'll live in your heart. Isn't God good to us? You there in Philippians, turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter number three. Ephesians chapter number three. And in Ephesians chapter number three, I'm going to take a look at verse number 17 through verse number 19. Paul is writing, he's, he's praying for the Ephesian church, and, and he's talking to them about their hearts. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17 through verse number 19. Actually, we got some time tonight, so I'm going to back up to verse number 14. Okay, this won't be up on the overheads, but go ahead. If you have your Bible, read along. If you don't, just listen. 
Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, he says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. Verse 16, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. He's not talking about outward appearances. He's not talking about physical, natural things. No, he's talking about spiritual things. And he's talking about them in the heart. Verse 17, it's up on the overheads for you. Verse number 17, look at this. That Christ may dwell. Where? In your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, verse 18, may be able to comprehend with all the saints. Look at these words. What is the width? What is the length? What is the depth and the height? See, that talks about room, doesn't it? He's talking about our hearts. He's talking about the spirit man. And he says that you may be able to comprehend and understand and start to get a hold of this. What is that width and length and depth and height? See, Jesus doesn't want just a little piece. He doesn't want just a corner. He doesn't want a recess over here or something like that. He doesn't want just a, 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 a nail on the wall where he can hang his picture. No, Jesus wants the entirety. He wants you to be wall to wall, Holy Spirit. He wants you to be filled with all of him. Let's look at it. Let's look at it. And you may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is that width and length and depth and height. Verse 19. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. The Bible tells us that in him, speaking of Jesus, dwells the Godhead bodily. When you receive Jesus in, when you make room for him in your heart, when you prepare that upper room, that large, expansive upper room, and he comes in, now all of a sudden you are filled with all the fullness of God. At the moment of salvation, you have all of God on the inside of you. Now, God may not have all of you yet. That's what we're learning to do is to yield up to him, yield our members to holiness and righteousness, learning how to do this, learning how to live. That's why we're in prayer. That's why we're in our word. That's why we're in church is because we're learning to give God all of us and, and to surrender every part and to, to give up our way and to go his way. But we can't do that until we first make room. How to ruin Christmas. A couple of things that we learned tonight. Number one, we learned that make Christmas about anything other than Christ you take Christ out, you just ruined it. You killed it. Number two, get so focused in the world that you miss Jesus. Sometimes we get so busy that we actually get brought under Satan's yoke. B-U-S-Y, brought under Satan's yoke. Are you listening? Yeah. And when you get busy with things other than the things of God, now all of a sudden, he's got you. He's got you off. Finally, how to ruin Christmas tonight. We learned that we just shut Jesus out. No room for him at the end. So... How do we have a great Christmas? How to have a great Christmas? Well, simply compare and contrast. So simple. How to have a great Christmas? Number one, make it about Christ. My goodness, put Christ back in Christmas. Put it in your house. Put it in your language. Put it in your conversations. Put it in your words. Put it in your, your writing. Whatever you're doing, man. When you sign a Christmas card, just put a verse right at the bottom. Just write down something, you know. Luke chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. Whatever you got to do. Put something in there. This is an opportune time. Make it about Jesus. Number two, get focused on Jesus in your personal life. If you've gotten off, hey, it's time to get back on. That's why we're here. That's why we preach like we do. That's why we come to church is to get you back focused on the things of God. And finally, how to have a great Christmas. Make room for Jesus. I heard a story. I want to share this as we close. That the Jewish people, when they would have their feast of the Passover, there at the table, they would always leave one chair open. And that one chair was for the Messiah, in case he wanted to come in and have dinner. Revelation, Jesus says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone opens the door, I will come in and I'll have dinner with them. Think about Jesus coming to your house. Think about Jesus sitting at your table. Think about Jesus loving on your kids watching as they open their gifts with excitement to see how they're going to respond when they see what they get. Think about Jesus sitting back with a cup of coffee, fuzzy slippers on, and, and, you know, he's hanging out. I mean, we laugh about that, but at the same time, think about Jesus in your everyday life. There have been great men and women of God who have gone before us that their lives were great, not because Jesus was out there, but because Jesus was brought into every area of their life. 
the, the brother Andrews, the mother Teresa's. Why? Because they saw Jesus in everything. This Christmas, you want to make it a great Christmas? Focus on Jesus. Get it wrapped around Christ and make room for Jesus in your house. Maybe physically you can do some things like leave a chair open at the table and tell your kids, hey, just in case Jesus comes back tonight, he can sit right there. How fun would that be? How cool would that be? You know, we're leaving milk and cookies out for Santa Claus. What are we doing for Jesus Christ? Are you listening? Come on, let's give the Lord a great big praise. Woo! God is good. Oh, I'm so grateful for Christmas. I love getting into the Christmas story. It's always refreshing, always something new. God is so good to us. Hey, what do you say with joy we bring our tithes and our offerings into the storehouse of God tonight? Amen. Yeah. God is so good to us. He gives us the opportunity to bring our best, to bring the first fruits, the Bible says, to honor the Lord with our increase, whatever God brings into our life. You know, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. It's all God's. To us, it's just on loan. For the time that we have here on the earth, God puts things in our hand. And what he asks of us is to make room for him, to put him first, to make him the priority, to focus on him and our finances. And as we do, God promises a blessing. God says, if you will bring your tithe and your offering to the storehouse of God, will I not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing on you? So much so, that you can't even contain it. My goodness, that's an overflowing blessing. That's an abundance. That's, that's not just you getting blessed. That's you getting blessed so that you can be a blessing. And that's the kind of blessing God wants to get into our lives. I want to mention to you guys, it's coming t- close to the end of the year. And so if you are a business owner or maybe uh, you're somebody who's thinking about an end-of-the-year gift, that sort of a thing, why not bring that into the house of God? Why not bring that to a church? And you say, but okay, with my business, I can't do that. Hey, we have a, a 501c3 as well that you can donate that to, and it can still come into the church. And this church is doing great things. Every time we receive uh, tithes and offerings, every time we receive any offering, it goes towards the poor. It goes towards reaching the community. It goes towards preaching the gospel. Everything that is brought into this house is used for those purposes and for those reasons. Literally reaching people around the world online with our missionaries. We're out in the streets, my goodness. Yesterday they went into convalescent hospitals. They had brought uh, Christmas gifts to the prisons. And my goodness, the prisons are getting tougher and tougher. I was just talking to some of the people that go into our prisons. They said it's getting tougher and tougher. But God opened the door. We got presents in there. And man, God is so good. That's what's going on in your church. Gifts are going out right now. The chapel is filled with gifts. <laughs> Saw a kid come up today. He ran up with his card. He's so excited. He said, where do I go to get this? And uh, one of our pastors walked him over there. But that's what this is all about. When we bring our tithes and our offerings, when we come together. And you know, who knows what's going to happen in the future? All I know is, who cares? The government's on his shoulders. God's in control. And whatever happens, God's going to take care of us. Now, listen, if tax deductible... In, uh, deductions go away, we don't give to get that. But it would be wisdom if you want that to think about doing that this year, okay? So why don't we do this? Let's believe God. Let's stand to our feet. And on the count of three, we'll make this profession of our faith, getting our faith focused in some areas, and then putting the word of God behind it from 2 Corinthians. Here we go. One, two, three. As we give in today's offering, we are believing the Lord for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, benefits, sales and commissions, Favorable settlements, estates and inheritances, interest and income, rebates and returns, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, bills decreased, blessings and increase, generosity, increased capacity, new skills, witty inventions and ideas, wise investments, paying off our church. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of my financial needs. Your word says... You are able to make all grace abound toward me, that I always have all sufficiency in all things and have an abundance for every good work. I now give into the kingdom of God to promote the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. (laughs) Amen. If you're in need of an envelope, you're given by cash or credit card. Please raise your hands and the ushers will spot you and get one of those envelopes down your direction. Also, you can check the seat in front of you and see if there's an envelope within reach. And you can give by cash or credit card on those envelopes. Just fill out the details on the inside all the way. If you're making out a check, make it out to the Rock Church. 
make sure that your information is correct on your check and then you don't need an envelope. And also for online giving, go to www.rockchurch.com and you can click on the online giving button. We do live stream Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Wednesday night at 7 p.m. So if you ever can't make it or someone that you know is outside of the area, they can tap in online. And as well, we put all the messages online absolutely free. So if you want to hear a message again or maybe you missed a message or you want to find out what's going on in the young adults or in the women's ministry, that sort of thing, it's all online for you. The word of God is rich and good. God is good to us. And ask everybody, please remain seated. Church is not done yet. Everybody stay put and check out what's coming up here at The Rock. If you're between the ages of 18 to 28, then come out to Shift Young Adults Christmas Party Friday, December 21st at 7 p.m. We'll have games, prizes, food, live music, and a powerful message. Children's ministry is provided. There's so much going on here at The Rock this Christmas season. Rock and Christmas is on Sunday, December 23rd at 6 p.m. So bring the whole family and enjoy the special night filled with Christmas carols and performances. Christmas services are Saturday, December 22nd, and Sunday, December 23rd in the morning. Be sure to bring your family and friends and enjoy this awesome time as we celebrate Christmas together. Christmas Eve communion service is on a special night, Monday, December 24th at 6 p.m. Invite your family and friends to this powerful service and come and witness a miracle in their lives. The church offices will be closed the week of Christmas. We will reopen on Monday, December 31st. New Year's Praise and Prayer Service is on Sunday, December 30th at 6 p.m. Come and kick off this year with a great and powerful message. We'll see you there. On Tuesday, January 1st, our offices will be closed for New Year's Day and will reopen Wednesday, January 2nd. To learn more about Christmas at the Rock, visit our website at www.rockchurch.com. I decided to go to the Rock Bible College because I wanted to have a stronger foundation in Christ. It has changed how I perceive the Bible. When you read your Bible, it's totally different. You see more depth and things that you didn't even know were there, now they're popping out. I would recommend the Rock Bible College to your friend because it is life-changing and you really can understand so much more. You are ready to take on whatever the enemy has for you. Earn your diploma in biblical studies. The Rock Bible College offers one of the greatest ministry studies programs in the Inland Empire. Register now for the 2013 winter semester. To register, call the church offices or visit our information booth in the outer foyer. The Rock Bible College. Commit. Learn. Grow. I just want to say thank you to all the volunteers and everybody that helped make Christmas Girls Night Out so wonderful. And all of those of you that attended, thanks for coming. That was just a fun time for all the ladies. Any of you girls have fun at Christmas Girls Night Out? My goodness. That was a great time. We launched Christmas, and it's just so much fun. Hey, I want to do something. We've got some time tonight, and uh, I just want to preach another message. No, I'm just kidding. But why don't we do this? You know, we talked a lot about witnessing to our family, witnessing to our friends, our coworkers, that sort of a thing. And, uh, you know, sometimes we come to church and, and get into a routine. And we come in, we don't know anybody, nobody knows us. But I, I want to get some of you maybe outside of your comfort zone a little bit, okay? Not too much. Don't worry, I'm not going to, you know, make you prophesy or testify or any of that kind of stuff. Not tonight, okay? We'll, we'll save that for another night. But, um, no, all I want to do is, is just, if we can, as Elijah plays, he's just going to play softly on the keys. And just find somebody next to you. Uh, somebody around you, front or behind you. And maybe there's somebody in your family. Maybe there's somebody in your work. Maybe there's a neighbor or somebody that's been on your heart. 
and you just want to pray for that individual this Christmas to get saved. Listen, as a church, we ought to lift one another up. The Bible says to bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And so all I'm asking you to do, you don't have to touch anyone. You don't have to any of that kind of stuff. You know, just get with somebody, introduce yourself, and then whoever it is that's on your heart this Christmas, the greatest gift that anybody could ever get is the gift of salvation. And so just lift up somebody there with just someone around you. Pray for that person. Call out their name before God. Ask that God would send laborers across their path. God would bring salvation, that they would give their heart and life to Jesus Christ. Hey, ask that God would bring them to this church. This is a good church, healthy church, and we'll love them. We'll train them up and raise them up in the ways of God, and they'll get encouraged and excited for Jesus. Maybe they're out of the area. Hey, ask that God would send laborers and that they'd get into a healthy church wherever they're at. But let's just take some time. You know, I believe that the Spirit of God is pleased when we come together in unity. And the Bible also says that if we agree as touching anything on earth, that it's agreed upon in heaven. Jesus said, pray the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest fields because they're ripe. People are ready. People are waiting for Jesus. Maybe God wants to use you as an answer to your own prayer. So maybe you want to lift that up too. God, give me boldness. Give me an opportunity. Give me an open door to speak into their life. Yeah. So Paul, let's give the Lord a praise. That's so good. If you would just have a seat right where you're at, I want to make sure before you leave this place that your heart and life is right with Jesus Christ. You know, it's one thing for us to talk about Jesus, talk about making him room, talk about all that stuff. Another thing to actually have received Jesus into your life. The Bible calls it being born again. And I know our society's made a mockery out of that term. They've raked it through the coals. They've made it out to be something that it's not. It's not about what society says. This is about what the Bible says. I'm not going to find out what being born again means through books and television and movies, the internet and that sort of a thing. I don't care what some radio host or television personality has to say. I want to hear what God has to say. Because ultimately, the goal of all of our lives is that we want to be with God. We want to go to heaven, denying our presence in hell. Now, sometimes people hear that term hell and they, 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 they say, well, wait a second. Hell, uh, you know, I, I, can't, I can't accept that. I don't believe in hell. Well, that's quite a convenient thing because did you know that in the Old Testament, New Testament talks about hell? All throughout the Bible, you'll find it. You know, Jesus talked about hell. Jesus spoke about it. All throughout the Bible, you'll find this concept, not just a concept, but a real place called hell. No one wants to go there. God doesn't want you to go there. It was never designed for you and I. It was designed for the devil and his angels that rebelled. But with our lives, you and I, while, the, while we have time here on the planet, we choose where we go, whether we go to heaven or whether we go to hell. And just by denying hell's existence doesn't make it any less real. It's like saying, I don't believe in semi-trucks. Go stand on a slow lane of the freeway. You'll meet one face-to-face -face sooner or later. So you can't just say, I don't believe in hell, and that means you don't go there. Now, sometimes people say, well, I believe in hell, but, you know, I also believe that all roads lead to heaven. God's a good God. He's loving. And, and in the end, God's going to have his way. He wants all people to go to heaven. Yeah, that's true. We can find that in the Bible. But... Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does it say you just do whatever you want and you get to go to heaven? Did you know that nowhere in the Bible does God say, oh, just live your life however you feel the best is, and that'll get you in heaven. That's good enough, and I'm going to have my way anyways. Not all roads lead to heaven. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you can do it your way or my way or some well-meaning church committee's way. We're not going to get there. not going to make it if that's how we think we're going to get to heaven. Tonight, come on, let's love you enough, respect you enough, honor you enough not to play games but to tell you the truth. You've got to get there one way, and that's God's way. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man goes to the Father except by me. So that means it's God's heaven. We've got to get there God's way. Sometimes people say, well, that's good news because, you know, I, I, I've been a good person my entire life, done a lot of good deeds, been nice to my neighbors, gave money to charities, helped people out, and, and used to be bad, but I cleaned my act up. Now I'm good, and therefore God's going to let me into heaven because God lets good people into heaven problem with that is, could you show that to me in the Bible? It's not there. Nowhere in the Bible to say you can be good enough to get to heaven because the standard is perfection. The only one who is perfect, his name is Jesus. And God is not some jolly old Saint Nick in the heavenly making a list and checking it twice of who's been naughty and who's been nice. Not going to get to heaven just by being good. Sometimes people say, well, but I was raised in church. My parents took me to church as a child, told me we were Christians. 
I've always thought of myself as a Christian. I was baptized, or maybe you were christened as a child. Parents hung a cross or a St. Christopher around your neck. You're born in America. America's a Christian nation. Everybody born in America is going to heaven. We're not any other religions. We're not Buddhist or Muslim or Hindus. Therefore, we're Christians headed for heaven, denying our presence in hell, right? Wrong. Nowhere in the Bible does it say you grow up, raised in church, parents call you a Christian, that makes you a Christian. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you wear religious jewelry, be baptized or christened as a child, or attend religious classes that you get to go to heaven. And again, I don't see anywhere in the Bible that because you're born in America or that because you're not some other religion, that by default, God loves you into the category of being a Christian, headed for heaven and denying hell. If that's how you think you're going to get to heaven, you're not going to make it. Tonight, I love you enough, respect you enough, and honor you enough to tell you the truth. Some of you in this room might be thinking, well, but not only when I was a child did I go to church. Here I am sitting in church right in front of you. It's great. I'm glad you're here tonight. But show that to me in the Bible, could you? Real quick, just show that to me where it says sit in church service. Warm up a seat in the sanctuary, and you get to go to heaven. It's not there. No one in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian. That makes you a Christian. This is like going down to the Pacific Ocean, sitting in the water, calling yourself a fish, and that makes you a fish. Mm -mm. just makes you a wet human sitting in the water. No one in the Bible says sit in church, call yourself a Christian, that makes you a Christian. You say, I, I understand that, but at my last church I got involved. I, I helped out, I carried the pastor's Bible, made decisions in that church. People thought of me as a leader. And I even got a membership card to that church and taught in the Bible classes. That's great, I'm glad you did those things, but could you show me where church involvement gets you into heaven? Where you help out, sing in the choir, carry the pastor's Bible, make decisions. People think of you as a leader, you get to go to heaven. God is not looking for your membership card to a church before you can enter the gates of heaven. And nowhere in the Bible does it say that because you teach the word of God that you get to go to heaven. You say, but I know God. I mean, somebody told me that if I knew God, I'm a Christian headed for heaven. And I know God. I know about Easter and the resurrection. Celebrate Christmas every year of my life and sing the songs. I, I could quote scriptures to you, Old and New Testament, Pastor. It's great. I'm glad you can do those things. But just, just show that to me in the Bible real quick, could you? Because it's not there. No in the Bible does it say that you have head knowledge about who Jesus is. Can celebrate a holiday, sing some songs, or quote some scriptures that you get to go to heaven. Everybody look up at me for a second. This is not about having head knowledge about who Jesus is. And that gets you right with God. It's not about what you have in your head or how much scripture you can quote. But rather this is about your heart. Let me prove it to you. If you'd read your Bible, you'd know that demons believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. They're not Christians headed for heaven. The Bible records the devil himself quoting scriptures, knows who Jesus is, and yet that doesn't qualify him for heaven. So you're not going to get to heaven by what you have up here in your head. It's about your heart. God has always been after your heart. God's looking for your heart, all of your heart and all of your life. We started out talking about being born again. What does being born again mean from the Bible? Well, it doesn't mean being good or attending church or getting involved or knowing something about God. It doesn't mean any of that. It means that you've given God all of your heart and that you've given God all of your life. It's that simple. All or nothing with Jesus. Let me prove it to you in the book of Revelation, last book of the Bible, Jesus is speaking to a church just like he's speaking to us here in this church tonight. And he says, when I come, I want to find you hot or I want to find you cold because if I find you lukewarm, I'll vomit you from my mouth. Now, those are graphic words from the mouth of Jesus, but what is he saying? Lukewarm, what's that all about? Well, it's a little in, a little out, a little up, a little down. A little token prayer every now and then, an occasional church attendance. God is something in your life, but he's not everything. And you're not opposed to God, but you're not wholehearted for God. Listen, if that's your relationship with Jesus Christ, look out. Why do I say that? Because only people that are not real Christians will be ejected and rejected from the body of Christ. So tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity in a moment. I'm going to go like this. One, two, three. Count to three. Pop my hands together when I say three, just like this. Bang! Bang! When you hear the sound of my hands popping together, just like that, bang, that's your opportunity to raise your hand. What you're doing by the raising of your hand is you're saying, I want to be born again. I want to be headed for heaven, denying my presence in hell. I'll see your hand go up. I'll count it. You can put it right back down. You say, whoa, 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 wait a second, wait a second. If I raise my hand, I'll be embarrassed. I came with people. Uh, uh, there's other people that I don't know. They'll see me. Uh-huh. Get over that embarrassment. Why? Because think of the trade-off for a moment. Isn't it better to be embarrassed for a moment than it is to end up in hell forever and ever and ever and ever? Listen, you'd do anything you could to get out of hell if you got there. It's a terrible place. But you don't have to go there. You can choose tonight. Choose this day where you're going to go. Will you make him room? He's standing at the door. He's knocking. 
Will you let him in tonight? You can acknowledge your need for Jesus and say yes to him by simply raising your hand tonight. All across this auditorium, wherever you're at, within the sound of my voice, back in the family rooms, or if you're watching by television, hey, get ready right where you're at to lift your hand. God is watching. Then you can tell an usher right afterwards or come into the church service. Who should raise their hand in a moment? If you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm speaking to you. Who should raise their hand if you're not sure about your salvation? Come on tonight, make sure. Who should raise their hand if you've never done this, never given God all your heart and life? Come on, tonight is your night. Finally, who should raise their hand if you're lukewarm in this place? You know that's the condition of your heart when I describe it. You can get right with God in a safe, friendly church service. I'll acknowledge it, count it, you can put it right back down. Probably won't even be embarrassed. Even if you are, it's better than going to hell. Jesus said, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father. But if you deny me, I will deny you. So tonight, your call, your choice. I've done my job. Loved you enough to tell you the truth. God's done his job sending Jesus. Born in a manger, like we talked about. Went to a cross. Died for the forgiveness of our sins and was raised again to life so that you and I could live with him. Now it's your turn. Will you give him all of your heart? Will you give him all of your life? Tonight is your night of salvation. I'm going to count to three. Pop my hands together. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. Here we go. All together on the count of three if you need to do this. One, two, three. Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. Just raise them up high right now. Thank you. There's one, two, three, four, five, six up there. Thank you. Six wise people already. Where are you at? Seven up top. Thank you. Eight, nine, ten. Got you right here. Anybody else real quick that I didn't already see? I got ten wise people already in the building. If that's you, thank you. Number 11, got you right there. Thank you. Anybody else real quick? Eleven wise people. Where are you at? Number 12. Number 12, you're sitting there and you're saying this in your heart. I wonder if I should do this. You should. Come on, if God's tugging at your heartstrings right now and you feel that pull, come on. Don't shut him out tonight. Anybody else, real quick? You know you need to give God all your heart and all your life. Anybody else? Anybody else? Thank you right here up front. God bless you, number 12. Anybody else? Anybody else? You know you need to do this. Come on. Come on, I'm giving you another opportunity. If that's you, you need to do this. All right. Well, let's give the Lord a hand for 12 wise people tonight. Amen. All 12 of you, so excited for you. Hey, it's not over. Something else I want you to do. I want you to be bold. I want you to take one more step, okay? Because we want to pray with you. We want to change destinies with you tonight. But we can't do that where you're at. We want to get you down here, get some stuff in your hands, okay? So in a moment, we're all going to sing a song. As we do that, we're going to give a clap, give a shout. And when you hear that music, this is your time to get your stuff. Get a friend if you need a friend. If you're sitting next to somebody that raised their hand, just nudge them and say, come on, friend, I'll go with you. Even if you didn't raise your hand, it's not too late. Come on, you can come too during this time. No one leaves during this time. Hard to get people to come down here when you're going that way. They'll follow you that way, okay? Let them come forward during this time. So let's all stand and let's welcome them as they come. You come right now. If you raise your hand or you should have raised your hand, just make your way to the front right now. You come. Won't you come just you are. They're coming. Let's give them a hand as they come. You can come too. This is your time. This is your moment of salvation. From the family rooms, bring your kids. Come on, they'll remember this. Anybody else, if you need to come, come on. Come on, this is your time. You're welcome. We got room for you. They're still coming. Anybody else? Come on, come on, come on, come on. Amen. All right. Hey, everybody up front, you can put a smile on your face. This is a good thing. This is not a bad thing, okay? Just put, put a smile on your face, all right? And it's Christmas. This is the most wonderful time of the year, and you're going to remember for the rest of your life that, that at Christmas time, you gave your heart to Jesus Christ. What an amazing thing. Right over here to my right, your left, this is my friend, Pastor Dave. Pastor Dave's a really good guy. Nothing weird is going to go on, okay? I want to let you know what Pastor Dave's going to do. First thing he's going to do, he's going to pray with you, lead you in a prayer to invite Jesus into your heart. You're going to be born again, all right? Second thing he's going to do is give you some free stuff. A little booklet our pastor wrote called Welcome to Your Destiny, Easy Steps to a Successful Future with God. Just going to help you to find out what to do next. Now that you're a Christian, what do I do? What's the next step? That book will help you. Real thin. Real easy material. Sit down, maybe give 20, 30 minutes if you're reading it, and it'll just help you to get your bearings. Listen, you invest 
more time in movies and television and phone calls and texting and games and all that kind of stuff. You can invest some time to find out what to do next in your walk with God. Third thing he's going to do is he's going to give you a friend. You said, say what? He's going to do what? Yeah, we give away friends here at The Rock. That's, that's just how we roll, all right? We call them spiritual personal trainers, okay? And you heard of a physical trainer at the gym, helps you get strong, get buff like me, right? Why are you guys laughing? Spiritual personal trainer will do that for you spiritually. Basically, it's a friend in church that will teach you th some things about God that help you to get strong in the ways of the Lord. It's easy, it's free, and you need to do it. Now listen, 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 listen. I want to make a promise to you. If you give God one year of your life here at this church, sitting under the word of God like we talked about, make room for Jesus. Give Jesus a year here at the Rock. Come every time the doors are open that you can get here. Okay, now we understand work schedules, all that kind of stuff, but get in church, get a hold of the word of God, give us one year, and at the end of that year, next Christmas, you'll look back on your life this past year, you will be so blessed, and for the rest of your life, you're going to say, I never knew it could be this good. Am I, am I telling the truth, everybody? Is that true? Amen. Now, it all starts with an SPT, okay? So he'll describe that, and then he'll let you come right back out. So if you guys will make a left turn, follow Pastor Dave. Let's give him a hand as they go. Hallelujah! Woo!